Lord Jesus, we were the very ones who loved darkness rather than light because our deeds were evil. And you broke through that darkness with your light, your life, your love. Oh, that you would love the likes of us and give us what we don't deserve and give us yourself. Knowing you truly is the definition of life. It is you we seek, it is you we proclaim, it is you that we love. And we do all these things imperfectly, longing for the day when we will do them unreservedly, without hindrance, without spot, without wrinkle. Help us this morning to hear from your word, to see you, to be changed. By the power of your Holy Spirit, work in us, O oh God, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We continue this morning in our Philosophy of Ministry series. And this morning, we are looking at Colossians 1, 28 and 29. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to that passage and if you don't have a Bible this morning, we'd love to put one in your hand. So just slip your hand up and let these fine gentlemen know that you would love a copy of God's Word uh, in your language. Uh, what a rich treasure that is to have the Bible in English. Um, and if your language is another language, it wouldn't help you. I, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying anyway. So there are still many tribes, peoples, tongues without God's Word in their language. We long for that even as we treasure God's word on our own. By the way, that's your Bible to keep if you don't own one. We'd love for you to have that as a gift from us. Organizations around the world, companies, businesses, nonprofits, have mission statements, purpose statements. They give you the reason for which they exist. They tell you what their priorities are. American Express defines theirs this way. <clears throat> We work hard every day to make American Express the world's most respected service brand. It's a lofty goal. Nordstrom says, our goal is to give customers the most compelling shopping experience. Can't say that I've been compelled. <laughs> PayPal, uh, Jeff, did you know this is why you exist? To build the world's, to build the web's most convenient, secure, cost-effective payment solution. It's its reason for existence. Tesla has a purpose statement to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport by bringing compelling mass market electric cars to market as soon as possible. <laughs> Listen, you're laughing already. You know that some of these don't live up to their purpose statements. That's all right. And, and some of these purpose statements are masking the fundamental reason for their existence. We'll get to that in just a minute. Starbucks gives as their purpose statement, to establish Starbucks as the premier purveyor of the finest coffee in the world while maintaining our uncompromising principles while we grow. Coca-Cola, to refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happiness, to create value and to make a difference. Walmart, we save people money so they can live better. Ferrari, we don't save people any money whatsoever. No, that's not what they say. <laughs> to make unique sports cars that represent the finest in Italian design and craftsmanship, both on the track and on the road. Nike, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world, asterisk, if you have a body, you are an athlete. Toyota, to attract and attain customers with high-valued products and services and the most satisfying ownership experience in America. These organizational purpose statements are critical for employees and customers to understand what they are all about. They're not always honest. Uh, they're not always forthright. And they probably leave out one of the fundamental reasons for their existence, which is that of profit, that profit motive is important, and there's nothing wrong with that fundamentally. 
and they seek to meet that purpose by offering a product or something that adds value to people, to customers. These organizations set to state their purpose in terms of meeting needs of people very often. And our text this morning is something of an organizational purpose statement for the church. And many organizations claim to be about people. If we set aside the profit motive, and again, there's nothing wrong with that, they're speaking about people in general. Whereas our purpose statement this morning for the ministry of the local church sets out as its aim, its purpose, people in particular, specific people, individuals, and every one of them. Turn your attention to Colossians 1, 28 and 29, and let's listen to the Apostle Paul describe his ministry purpose. He says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. This morning we're looking at the priority of Paul's life and labor. And the priority of that life and labor was to present people to Christ complete. In Colossians 1, 28 and 29 this morning, we'll see the apostle describing his own ministry, and we'll unfold that in five elements. The first element of Paul's self-description of his ministry purpose is the subject matter. The great subject matter of Paul's ministry was the proclamation of Jesus Christ. We see that in the first couple of words of verse 28. Paul says, we proclaim him. And who is the him here? This is a reference back to Christ found in verse 27, the verse right above. Jesus Christ is the great centerpiece of Paul's ministry. Everywhere he went, the proclamation of Jesus Christ was his staple. Notice this him in verse 28 refers to the Christ in verse 27. And this takes us all the way back to Christ described in the first part of Colossians 1. Paul says in verse 12, he gives thanks to the Father who has qualified us believers to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For God the Father rescued us, verse 13, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. There's Christ. In whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For by him, that is by Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. All things have been created through him, that is through Jesus, and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all of the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This is the Jesus that Paul proclaims, the creator and sustainer of all things, the head of the church, the beginning and the end, the one who has conquered death, risen again, and conquers death for all who believe in him the one who reconciles sinners to a holy God, and the one by whom all things in the universe will be reconciled to God. And not all of those things are reconciled to God in a saving way. Jesus is not only Savior of those who believe, but judge of those who don't. And so Jesus, the centerpiece of God's unfolding plan in human history, is the centerpiece of Paul's proclamation. And when Paul says, we proclaim him, this is a summary statement of the entirety of Paul's messaging. 
The New Testament is a proclamation of Christ. This is not merely a statement about who Jesus is and what he has done at the cross. It is a summary way to describe all that the New Testament does in unfolding the person and work of Jesus Christ in all of their ramifications. The great subject matter of Paul's ministry, the proclamation of Christ, is that first element of the way he viewed ministry. The second element is Paul's method. The method of Paul's ministry was careful, thorough, personal instruction. What is involved in Paul's proclaiming Christ? What is it that Paul is doing in his proclaiming of Christ? What did this proclaiming of Christ look like in Paul's practice? He gives it to us right here in verse 28, careful, thorough, personal instruction. He says, instructing, teaching, admonishing. He does not simply speak of Christ and what Christ has done. Along with the person and work of Christ, he carefully and personally draws out the implications of knowing Christ, following Christ, and obeying Christ. Notice the activities that attend Paul's proclamation of Christ in verse 28. Admonishing every man and teaching every man. This word to admonish is to counsel about the avoidance or correction of an improper course of action. So there's a wrong way to live, a wrong way to think, a wrong way to conduct oneself, and admonition is the prevention of going down that wrong way or the correction once you are on it. It is to warn, to correct, to, as one man put it, to put a good mind into a man when there is something else there. It is the prevention and correction of errors in thinking and behavior. And this is a common enough word in Paul's ministry, Acts 20, 31. Paul said, therefore, be on the alert. This was his speech to the Ephesian pastors. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. There we get the the feelings that Paul felt as he warned and corrected Uh, the Ephesian elders in the body of Christ there at Ephesus. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul says this, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person, do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame, yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. This admonition is what we do with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ because we love one another. In Romans 15, 14, Paul makes it clear that this wasn't his job only. He says, concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. This is something believers were to do. And Paul says that his proclamation of Christ came with admonishing every man and, secondly, teaching every man. And this is the positive side of instruction. It is the imparting of positive truth. We know that 1 Timothy 3.2 says that pastors or elders must be able to teach. It's the same root word. We also know that in Matthew 28.20 in Jesus' great commission, that disciple-making disciples of Jesus, that is all Christians, are supposed to be doing something, teaching others to obey all that Christ commanded. And when we put these two ideas together, the positive instruction and the correction of error, these are two activities that go along with the proclamation of Christ. We admonish one another and we teach one another. And notice how Paul puts this, every man. We admonish every man and we teach every man, every person. No one is left behind in this. And Paul modifies both of these activities with the phrase, with all wisdom, with all wisdom. And he's not appealing to some sort of esoteric secret wisdom that's available only to the elite, but with God's wisdom, accessing God's mind and the mind of Christ, like we looked at a few weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 1. It is the wisdom of God imparted to those who believe. And we instruct and we admonish with God's wisdom in each other's lives. And notice the subject of verse 28, we, you see that we proclaim him. And this is in contrast to the other pronouns in this passage. 
In verses 24 to 27, it's all I. Paul is speaking there in the first person. And he talks about his own sufferings as an apostle and his own ministry in specifics. But in verse 28, he switches to we. Who is the we here in verse 28? He's including people besides himself. In other words, what Paul is enjoining here is not just instructions about his own life and ministry, not just unique to himself as an apostle, but to others as well. And the we in verse 28 could be Paul and Timothy. Timothy is referenced in verse 1 1. This letter comes to the church at Colossae from Paul and Timothy. It could include Epaphras. Epaphras is the Gentile from that region that reported to Paul and Timothy about their faith. He's mentioned in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. We find out a little bit more about this Epaphras in chapter 4. Paul records in Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, who is one of your own number, a slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Paphras would be one of those that Paul could be including in this we. Of course, others are mentioned in chapter 4 of Colossians. Tuchicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, Justus. These are all fellow workers from the circumcision mentioned in chapter 4. And then there is Luke and Demas and Archippus and Nympha. These are all believers at Laodicea also mentioned. But I think the we here probably includes more than Paul and his companions. I think it is an expansion to include the readers of this letter. The we here is also tied to the you at the end of verse 27. Notice how Paul concludes that verse God God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Colossians, the hope of glory. And then he goes on to say, we proclaim him. I believe Paul is including the Colossian believers in this we, in the ministry of proclamation of Jesus Christ that comes along with admonitionizing. What is the word I'm looking for? Admonishing and teaching every man. And we'll talk more about the part that all believers have in this. Paul here is indicating that this kind of proclamation of Christ that is accomplished through instruction, both the warning kind and the teaching kind, correcting and informing, addressing error and positively proclaiming the truth, this kind of proclamation is the task of believers, not simply the task of the apostle. This is what we do. There's a third element of the way Paul views his own ministry, also found in verse 28, and it is Paul's aim. And what Paul is aiming at in his ministry is Christ-like people. Christ-like people. Here's where we see the priority of people in Paul's ministry in the very aim of his ministry. Notice the second half of verse 28. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, so that... Here's this purpose statement. So that we may present every man complete to Christ. This word for present here is probably to take on a forensic meaning, a legal meaning. The idea of presenting something before a judge in a courtroom setting. Paul's aim here is to present people to Christ. He wants to present people before Christ. And give close attention to the way he states the aim of his ministry. So that we may present every man complete to Christ. This is the third time in this verse Paul uses the phrase every man. Did you notice that? Paul's trying to get across something here, a priority One commentator said this, Paul seems to be emphasizing his pastoral commitment to every last person who is under his care. We admonish every man, we teach every man with this aim, this purpose, to present every man complete to Christ. No one left behind. For the Apostle Paul, the ministry of the local church was to be about people, But not simply about the idea of people or or just an anonymous mass of people. 
but about individuals, each individual, every person, every last one. And how did Paul want to see every person presented before Christ? Complete. Complete. And this word can have the meaning of perfect or complete or mature, depending on the context. Fundamentally, it means to be fully grown. Paul's ministry aim is to have every individual believer mature, complete, fully grown. What does Christian maturity look like? What is it precisely that Paul was aiming for? We, we see Paul's idea of this Christian maturity in other places. We see this throughout the New Testament. In fact, under the writing of the Apostle James, we see a picture of mature faith. That is, an enduring faith that is tested by trials, refined by trials, and comes forth in the mature or the complete Christian. For Paul in Ephesians 4, maturity meant a maturity in theology, a maturity in discernment. He said this in Ephesians 4, 14 and 15, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him, to Christ who is the head. And the writer to Hebrews describes maturity in terms of a mature conscience. That is a discernment about the difference between right and wrong. Hebrews 5.14 says this, Solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. A mature believer is one who has been refined and tested and grown up by trials endured well in faith. A mature believer is one who has grown in their knowledge of Christ and their knowledge of the truth so that they know the difference between error and truth. And a mature Christian is one who has trained his senses, trained his conscience in terms of doing what is right and what is pleasing before the Lord. This is the kind of maturity that Paul has in mind, the the kind of maturity that proclaiming Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man that we might present every man complete in Christ, that's the kind of maturity Paul has in view. It's actually summed up well in the prayer Paul describes for the Colossian believers in chapter 1. Look back to verse 9. This is such a great window into the way the Apostle Paul prayed for believers. He says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, that is, heard of your love in the Spirit, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You see, even there in Paul's prayer are all those same elements of maturity that he is laboring for and striving for, that he is praying for. You see, Paul's aim is aligned with his prayers. Paul's prayer for the Colossian believers was the same as his ministry aim for them. But notice verse 22 of Colossians 1. Jesus has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order. Here's another purpose statement. This time the purpose statement is by Jesus. What is Jesus purposing at? To present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Do you see that Jesus' goal... Jesus' goal in coming to the earth and dying for sinners, paying for their sins, qualifying them to share in the inheritance of light, his goal is the same as Paul's ministry aim, to present us believers before Jesus holy and blameless and beyond reproach. 
And so what do we find about Paul's purpose in ministry? Paul is aligning himself with Jesus' purpose in his ministry aim for the Colossians. And Paul's prayers are aligned with that same purpose. Paul's aim and the ministry purpose he directs us all toward is Christ-like people, complete, mature, grown up. And there's a fourth element of the way Paul views his own ministry and it is the means of his ministry. We've seen the subject matter and his method and his aim. Here, Paul tells us the means of his ministry was agonizing effort. Agonizing effort. We read this in verse 29. Paul says, for this purpose, the purpose he just stated, I also labor striving. I labor striving. These two words, labor and striving, are all often paired in things that Paul writes. The word labor is to work or toil. It is effort to the point of wearied exhaustion. This is uncompromising hard work. One dictionary says it this way, it is to exert oneself physically, mentally, or spiritually, to work hard, to toil, to strive, to struggle. And he says, I labor striving. Here's this word, a near synonym that's paired with it. It is where we get our English word, agonize. The Greek word is agonize. <laughs> there you know a Greek word. You use it in English all the time. It is to fight or struggle as in the arena. The root word meant to compete in the games. It is to engage in a contest, to strive, to contend. Paul uses this word at the conclusion of 2 Timothy 4. He says, I have fought the good fight. Literally, I have agonized the good agony. Paul employs this pair of words to describe his ministry on several occasions. I labor and strive, he says here, for this purpose to prepare every man under my care to meet Christ mature, complete, fully grown. Paul strains like a workman digging ditches all day or like a professional athlete straining in the gym and leaving it all, all out on the field. He worked himself to the point of wearied exhaustion for the sake of believers maturing in their faith. Paul's subject matter was Christ. His method was instruction. His aim was mature believers, Christ-like people, and his means was labor and toil. And that leads us to the last element of the way Paul viewed his own ministry, his resource. The resource for Paul's ministry was the power of Christ in him. Read verse 29, for this purpose also I labor striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. This prepositional phrase, according to, indicates a standard. Paul's work had to measure up to a certain standard. Paul, how hard were you supposed to work? How hard were you supposed to toil and strive and struggle according to God's power? It's a tall task. The standard by which Paul was expected to operate in ministry was God's power? How could Paul ever live up to that standard? Only if God's power mightily worked within him. And this is precisely what he says in verse 29. According to his power, which mightily works within me. John Calvin said, Paul's endeavors exceed human limits. That's right. Notice here in this verse the, the combination of human effort and divine enablement. Paul worked to the point of wearied exhaustion, but he did so on the basis of God's power within him. This is not mere natural ability. Something much greater is required for this task. And this is in keeping with the way Paul viewed his life and his efforts. 1 Corinthians 15.10 by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. I labored even more than all of the others, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. 
In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Who was the one living Paul's life? Was it Paul or Christ? And the answer is yes. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What was the resource for Paul's energy, for Paul's labors and toil? And, and this window into Paul's view of himself in 2 Corinthians 3 is critical. He says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God who also made us ad ad adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. Paul knew where his strength for this toilsome labor of a life of ministry on behalf of others would come from, not from his own resources, though he would exert himself to the point of wearied exhaustion in the resources that Christ provided in Colossians 1, we see the Apostle Paul praying for Jesus' people, aligning himself with Jesus' purpose, and laboring with Jesus' power. And Paul's priority is not buildings, programs, ministries, the way we often think of those things. By the way, there weren't church buildings in the first century. <laughs> those didn't exist probably until the fourth century. The success of a ministry of any church is not to be found in the size of its building, but in the maturity of its people. It's not to be found in the complexity and variety of its programs, but in the Christ-likeness of every believer. Not in the excellence of its presentation, but in care for each individual unto growing conformity to Jesus. That's the aim of ministry. That's the priority of ministry, to present every man complete in Christ. That was Paul's aim. In his helpful book, uh, The Trellis and the Vine, uh, the author Collins describes the ministry of a local church with an extended metaphor. He describes the, the ministry of the church, the, the New Testament ministry of the church as a vine, a, a living plant that bears fruit. And he describes the programming of the church, the organizational structure of the church as its trellis. The vine is the living plant and the trellis is the framework on which that plant can grow and thrive. And I think it's a helpful metaphor. It, it helps us keep in mind what is the actual living thing that God is doing in our midst versus what is a support structure. We don't have a trellis for its own sake any more than we have programs in a church for their own sake. You understand that the programming of the church is important. Somebody walks in on a Sunday morning and unlocks the door and turns on the lights and gets the air conditioning going and Tommy is back there making sure that things can be heard and the sound is balanced and the musicians rehearse and there's all kinds of mechanisms and things that go on to bring about the real thing, which is the ministry of the church, bringing everybody to maturity in Christ. There are a number of different programs at Grace Bible Church, things that you participate in, things like small groups, Wellspring, Build, The Trust, Next Generation Ministries, Student Ministries. All of these things are something like the trellis upon which the vine of Christ proclaiming, admonishing and teaching, bringing everybody to maturity kind of ministry can happen. One of the things we have to be careful of in prioritizing people in ministry is that we don't let programs become the thing and leave the people being brought to maturity in Christ and leave that behind. And it's very easy to do. A church starts a program because it actually helps accomplish one of those things to bring people to maturity. Teaching, admonition, uh, I can't even say that word, warning. 
And at some point, a program can replace the thing for which it exists. The vine might die altogether, but man, that's a really nice trellis, and we keep working on the trellis. And we might stain it and paint it and make it bigger and bigger and bigger, and we start to think, oh my goodness, I need some vines for this trellis. Let's recruit some more vines. This trellis is so great. Do you understand the problem when programs become the machinery that we have to feed people into and people get chewed up and spit out? Programs are dispensable. People, indispensable. And so this is one of the things we just must always be mindful of. Programs are good when they serve their purpose. When they meet this great ministry aim of presenting every man complete in Christ. The danger is when the program becomes more important than the thing for which it exists. And it's easy to get locked into our traditions, the way we've always done things. Or if you started a ministry and you poured your life into it and you invested in it and and, and then nobody's coming to it, you can feel an ownership and even a personal insult when the program isn't being attended. We have to be careful of that. There are indispensable elements in the ministries of a church. The corporate gathering, intentional giving, preaching, prayer, singing, the public reading of Scripture, the one another commands of the New Testament, and many other things that the New Testament says believers must do in the context of the local church. But the programming that sets out to accomplish these things can come and go as the needs are. We should never get into the mindset that says, oh, that church over there doesn't do small groups. They must be unbiblical. They don't have Wellspring. Oh, they're in sin. We love Wellspring. We, We love small groups. They actually are effective means for accomplishing the very things we've been talking about this morning. In fact, the elders are so committed to these things that We believe they're the best implements for this body of believers to grow together in Christ. Small groups and Wellspring and every other program at GBC do not exist for themselves. The reason for these various programs of the the church is summed up in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete to Christ. The priority is people, and specifically people being brought to maturity. So the reason for small groups, the reason for an equipping hour, or the reason for biblical counseling training, or for student ministries, or next generation ministries, or build, wellspring, the expositor seminary, or the trust, all of these things are in place in order to try to accomplish that fundamental aim. And the leadership at Grace Bible Church has this ministry purpose in mind as well. A plurality of elders and deacons and small group leaders and discussion group leaders in various ministries, they have as this aim the same thing Paul describes here. This is also to be the ministry mindset of every believer. Ephesians 4.12 tells us that church leaders are given by Jesus to the church for the equipping of the saints for the work of what? Ministry. And ministry is about having every man, every person, every believer presented to Christ complete. This is one of the significant features of all of those one another commands in the New Testament. Colossians 3.16 says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, all of you, with all wisdom, here's the same two words again, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You see, this is the corporate responsibility of all believers with God's wisdom to teach and admonish one another to this same aim, that we all might be complete and mature in our presentation to Christ. Let me ask you a question. How are you doing on the receiving end of Jesus' aim, of God's purpose for the ministry of the local church? 
Do you find yourself fighting against the Lord's purpose? How well do you handle admonition and instruction? You think about small groups and we think about core questions. We think about those four questions we love to ask each other week after week in small group. What are you learning in God's word? What are you praying about? How are you seeing God answer prayer? Who are you sharing the gospel with and and whom can we be praying for? And how are you addressing sin in your own heart and your own life and your thoughts and attitudes and behaviors? There's a reason we ask those questions week after week together in smaller groups. It's because we believe what Paul says in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Our goal together with each other is to present one another complete in Christ. Are you transparent, receptive, eager for those opportunities on the receiving end? And on the giving end of this ministry, are are you concerned for the people around you? At the heart level, with, with what they believe, what they know, and how they think, what they do. Is your brother's welfare in the body of Christ, is your sister's spiritual welfare in the body of Christ of concern to you? Is it your aim? Are other people your priority in the local church? This is what Paul is aiming at here. This becomes a a part of the warp and woof of how the body loves the body of Christ, how we care for one another. And every believer has a part to play in this proclaiming of Christ, in admonishing and teaching with all wisdom, with the design of presenting every person to Christ complete. And listen, not everybody has exactly the same role, not everybody has exactly the same gifting, not everybody has the exact same audience or opportunity, but everybody has a part in this. R. Kent Hughes tells a story Some years ago, a woman in Africa became a Christian. Being filled with gratitude, she decided to do something for Christ. She was blind, uneducated, and 70 years of age. She came to her missionary with her French Bible and asked her to underline John 3.16 in red ink. Mystified, the missionary watched her as she took her Bible and sat in front of a boy's school in the afternoon. When school dismissed, she would call a boy or two and ask them if they knew French. When they proudly responded that they did, she would say, please read the passage underlined in red. And she would tell them about Christ. The missionary says that over the years, 24 young men became pastors due to her work. What a great aim. If that is our aim and our purpose as we work together in the body of Christ to present everyone, no one left behind, no child, no man, no woman in the body of Christ, but to work hard together to present everyone complete, mature to him. What a great aim to work together, to labor together for, to strive together for with the Apostle Paul, with the elders of this church, with your small group leader, with one another. Let's pray. God, thank you for this picture of what it means to be in the body of Christ, of what it is we should be aiming at, those who have been rescued by your blood, placed into your church, equipped with the very tools and resources we need to accomplish your great purpose to prepare a people for yourself, purify, spotless, a people for your own possession, to be in your presence, blameless with great joy. God, help us to this task with the energy that only you can provide, with the resources only you can give. We ask it in Jesus' name.